Okay, so we've got overturning. All right, everybody, let's do a very introductory lesson on shear walls. Now, you can see I have a shear wall behind me. Behind you, the camera is a shear wall. All of our exterior walls are sheathed, and I want to demonstrate why that is. Basically, there's three forces that either wind or seismic exerts on the building. Now, we have gravity loads, and that's what our beams carry. Snow load, live load, the materials load. We're taking those loads, transferring them down to the foundation and out into the ground. When it comes to the uh, force from wind, think of wind coming perpendicular to the building. In order for that wall not to just cave in, the shear walls on either side, the roof, and even the floor system help to distribute that into shear walls and down. Now, wind loads can actually go up before coming down. Earthquake loads, what we're really trying to do is prevent three different things from happening. First of all, we're trying to prevent racking. Second, we're trying to prevent base shear. And third, overturning. So let me just show you what each of those does. Again, this is very introductory, but I think if, if, as framers, if we understand this stuff a little bit better, then, then maybe we do a little bit job with the workmanship, okay? This is a four foot wall, 104 and 58 studs. So it's nine foot, one and an eighth, double top plates. Now I've just temporarily screwed this thing together, so it's not, it's not a permanent wall. We want this wall to stay as a rectangle in high winds and in earthquakes. And just generally speaking, we don't want the loads on a building, they, they're gonna end up in the ground one way or another. They're gonna either end up that way through beams and shear walls or through collapse. I think we wanna prevent collapse, right? This is racking. We have a wall that's fastened to the ground and basically we can very easily turn this into a parallelogram. That's racking. Okay, so you imagine if all of your walls did this in an earthquake or in, in very high winds. Well, no bueno, right? Now to prevent this from happening, we rely on wood structural panels typically. There's all kinds of ways that we can build shear walls. They can be metal moment frames, they can be specially designed, basically pre-built shear walls made of wood or metal. But oftentimes, we're just gonna attach wood sheathing, plywood or OSB, to the face, at usually one face of a wall. Basically what that does, here's one example. This is 7 16 OSB. This panel has an inherent rigidity to it. Notice that I can't turn this into a parallelogram, right? By the way, that's overturning. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Base shear, that's base shear. <laughs> okay, so there's three, those, those are the three things with lateral force that we wanna be aware of. Back to the wood structural panel. The inherent strength that is built into plywood and OSB, we wanna transfer that to the wall because I can't easily make this panel deform. So here's how we do that. Okay, so the way that we transfer the inherent rigidity of the wood structural panel, in this case it's 7 16 four feet wide by nine foot tall. We can order eight foot, nine foot. You can get custom lengths. We can order 10 foot. Uh, West Fraser makes, like, like our wall studs here, 104 and 5 eighths plus three plates is 109 in an eighth. Well, that's just a little bit bigger. So you notice we're three quarters off the ground, we're three quarters down. You can actually buy sheathing that is exactly 109 and an eighth. I'll link all that stuff in the description. The way that this works is we have to fasten with either staples or nails the wood structural panel to the underlying framing members. The most important part of that is our edge nailing. So what we want to do is take the rigidity of the wood structural panel Remember, we can't really turn this into a parallelogram, but we can the wall. So by attaching this to the wall, so you can see it's like I'm pushing. At this point, I only have one, two, three, four, five, six nails. I didn't even do the top plates. And you can see now I can't push that wall like I could before. So the way that this works is we sheath our wall with whatever sheathing that the engineer tells us. Often it's 7 16 plywood or OSB. 
Shear wall tables are based on nail spacing and the size of the nail. Then you can look at the code table and you can say that this wall will take this particular load. Typically for us, we're six inches around the whole perimeter and 12 inches in the field. We use a two and a half inch by 0.131 inch nail. The nail thickness or diameter, like the shank thickness, plays a role because it's the strength of that nail, right? We're talking like shear forces or lateral forces. If a super thin nail, right, it's just inherently weaker in shear. At the same time, we don't want to blow apart the wood. So typically for us, six and 12 in the field. Remember boundary nailing means that you go right up against, so top plates, edges, bottom plates, that's our edge nailing. And then if we come to the edge of a window or door, same spacing as the edge nailing. That's called boundary nailing. For us, typically we're six inches around the perimeter, 12 inches in the field. Sometimes we're four and eight. Higher capacity shear walls, we might be three and six. It all depends on what the engineer has specified for that wall. Now, what gives the shear wall its strength is mostly the edge nailing. I'll show you why in just a moment. That's why we're sheathed vertically is we have solid backing around our edges. If we sheath horizontal, we horizontally, we then have to block those edges because think about it, if we were horizontal, we would have a nail every 16 inches. But our code table says we need six inches. How do you get that? Well, you have to block panel edges. This is a more efficient use of materials and labor. It can improve the air leakage numbers, so lower air leakage, and it saves us labor. It saves us blocking. Also means we can put more insulation in the wall. Now let's talk Now the reason why these are spaced fewer is because they're there just to keep the panel flat. I mean, think of a piece of paper. If I push this together, I can get it to bubble out. So if that's flat, it's very easy for me to potentially make it do this. So if the force is pushing, I can, I can just bubble that out. So the field nailing is there to keep the panel flat and in plane with the wall. So nail size, length and diameter, and nail spacing, and then thickness of sheathing. Don't quote me on this, but I think once you get over half inch sheathing, then that actually doesn't make any more difference. It really is about the nail size and the nail um, spacing. We also don't want to overdrive the nail. You want the nail head flush with the panel. If you overdrive too many, it can actually essentially make the panel act like a thinner panel because the connection point is then, let's just assume, it's halfway through. I think that is pretty intuitive, makes sense to us. I'll put a uh, link to an APA tech note that shows, you know, what percentage can be overdriven or even missed without a loss of capacity. So racking, that was our first force, right? I can't rack, I can't turn it into a parallelogram anymore. But there's two other forces that the wind and seismic, or earthquakes, is going to play on our wall. Base shear and overturning. So I've got a couple screws in the bottom plate. I'll show you both. Try to do this safely. Okay, I'm gonna keep one hand on this wall. So let's go base shear first. If I don't have the wall anchored properly, then literally we can take that nice, nice beautiful shear wall that we built and it can literally just slide. So that's what anchor bolts are for. The other thing is, and this is where hold downs come into play, is we can also overturn the wall. So if there's a force big enough, I can literally just turn it right over. That's why we need tie downs. At a certain height to width ratio, we need to start adding hold downs or tie downs to the foundation or something else that's solid so that we don't get this. I'm gonna screw these in so that it's safe. Okay, it holds. <laughs> okay, so the last thing I want to mention is there are different types of sheathing. The OSB panel here, it has an APA stamp on it, so that's an industry standard for wall sheathing. This is the zip system panel, and it is a structural one panel, specifically designed to go vertical and provide just a little bit more stiffness. Actually, the, the uh, load tables can go up just a little bit with structural one panels. 
The other thing about this panel, it's four by eight, so we would have to block the panel edge, because remember, we need that consistent uh, edge nailing spacing. <laughs> I think I'd probably say that better. It's the edge nail spacing, right? So if we're six inches everywhere, then we have to block that so we're six inches there too. This panel has the green coating is a weather resistive barrier that is bonded to the panel, the OSB panel, during manufacturing. So what that means is, is once it's fastened, we can tape the seams, improve our air tightness numbers, and it is ready for siding. We don't need to put a house wrap over the top of it. This sheet can also go vertically or horizontally, and we know that because it has a fastening pattern. This is 16 inches running this way. This is two foot. This is 16 again. And then if we rotate the panel, we could use it horizontally or on the roof, and same thing. We have 16 inch, two foot, so on and so forth. Here's what that panel looks. Tico tested. So again, an industry standard for wall sheathing, wall and roof sheathing. One other thing that I want to point out, it says strength axis this way. That does not apply most of the time to wall sheathing. What that applies to is when we use it for a roof or a floor situation. This is true of both of these panels, by the way. The strength axis runs the direction of the, the long edge, the eight or the nine foot or the 10 foot long edge. What that means is that when we step on the panel on the floor roof application, it's stiffer in between the supporting members. It doesn't actually relate to lateral applications. And again, I will link to notes in the description below from the manufacturers that clearly state that. Okay, so just, one, just a quick recap. We have wind and earthquake forces. Those are our, our lateral loads. Remember, we're trying to keep our walls to stay in their shape, the house or the structure to stay in its shape. It could collapse. One way or another, those forces are going to transfer through the building and out into the ground. They can either do that through load paths or they can do it through building collapse. Clearly, we want to avoid <laughs> building collapse. There's a significant advantage in lightweight wood construction. It's easy to build, and because it's lightweight, the forces of an earthquake on a building are directly proportional to the weight of the building. So lighter weight structures see less forces. Additionally, wood can actually absorb and dissipate some of those forces, so it's rigid, yet it's flexible where we need it to be. For us as builders and framers, our job is to make sure that we have the right size sheathing and that we get our edge nailing and our field nailing correct with the correct fastener. When we do all those things according to the engineer, we end up with strong, safe buildings that save lives and often require a whole lot less rework after a significant wind or seismic event. I hope this has been helpful. I'm not an engineer. This is very, very basic. But I think it's just having a very basic understanding as framers, then we go, okay, so when I'm boundary nailing at the edge of my windows, when I'm nailing into my top plates, when I'm nailing into my bottom plates, when I add my hold downs and I install them correctly, like there's, there's not a lot of rocket science to it. Consistent uh, craftsmanship then the occupants of our buildings, they'll be safe. Okay, thanks for uh, following along. If you feel like it, you can like and subscribe to the channel. Turns out most people that follow the channel do not click the notification button. Why not? Just hit that notification button. I only put out a couple videos a week, so anyway, we'll see you in the next video.